With this uh, fifth lecture, we begin the second half of our introduction to moral philosophy. And at this halfway point, it perhaps would be best if we reviewed where we have been and why we have come the route uh, that we have come. Uh, our first uh, discussion, you remember, before we turned to moral philosophy in particular, was to say a few things about philosophy in general. Uh, and here we recalled uh, its origins uh, with the Greeks and um, dwelt uh, somewhat, at least, on that remarkable fourth century before the birth of Christ when we had the sequence of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, uh, whose writings, whose thoughts uh, have uh, defined the history of philosophy ever since. Even though, as we saw when we move into the uh, Christian era, uh, the uh, works of antiquity uh, are very difficult to come by, and uh, the languages in which they were written were lost in large part uh, in the Latin West. Uh, the turmoil, the political and uh, turmoil in the West uh, led uh, to circumstances that made uh, uh, the pursuit of culture difficult. But um, as we noted, it was in the monasteries uh, where uh, there was an effort made to hang on to at least some remnants of this uh, culture from antiquity and to pass it on so that uh, libraries would trade manuscripts with other libraries to build up their, to build up their, their holdings. Uh, during this period, uh, education uh, swung around the concept of the liberal arts, and the liberal arts were uh, considered to be a summation of secular learning. One of the great themes, as we mentioned, of uh, the Christian era is the continuing dialogue, the continuing discussion of the relationship between faith on the one hand, what God has revealed to us about himself and ourselves, on the one hand, truths that we would not otherwise have known, and on the other hand, philosophy, that is, those truths about ourselves and the world and some intimation of uh, God that uh, human beings can achieve by using their own natural powers. What is the relationship between uh, these two? This is the, the question that posed itself when uh, the Christian era began, uh, and uh, particularly those converts uh, who had been trained in pagan learning uh, ask the question, well, what is the relationship between that and what I have now received uh, by way of revelation, the teaching of the, uh, of the church? And a lot of uh, different, uh, various uh, solutions were, were proposed, but uh, what we uh, were suggesting was that what we see through the uh, Christian era uh, is uh, that constant questioning of that relationship. Uh, some tended to want to dismiss entirely uh, the uh, natural use of reason and rely entirely on, on revelation. Uh, sometimes there seem to be those who were trying to reduce revelation to what could have, could have been known uh, by, the, uh, by the human mind and its natural powers, as if revelation were simply uh, a kind of expedient which could be overcome in this life by the uh, more acute use of reason. Uh, it would be as if some one of your uncles told you uh, some, uh, some, something as true, and you didn't know whether it was true, but you took his word on it, but later on you found out on your own it was true, and then you would say, well, yeah, I once uh, held that on the basis of trusting him, but now I know it on my own. Sometimes people talked about Christianity as if it were something that when you're small or dumb, you would hold on the basis of revelation, but if you got smart and went to the university, you would transfer it over to the side of knowledge and be able to have these as validated truth. The, uh, the position that emerges and which uh, bears in large part the stamp of uh, Thomas Aquinas is that there is a complementarity between faith and reason and between philosophy and theology, but that uh, they remain uh, formally different. And the way in which that formal difference uh, was described, remember, in terms of their arguments, the kind of discourse uh, that we find uh, characterizing philosophy on the one hand and theology on the other, uh, was this that a philosophical argument is such that it takes off from what everybody already knows. And if the new uh, claims cannot be hooked onto and be shown to derive from and to be compatible with what everyone already knows, they lose. The, the new proposal uh, is, uh, is the loser, not uh, what everybody already knows. 
On the other hand, uh, in theology, the starting points are the, are the truths which God has revealed, which of course we accept on faith. So we're able to enter into that kind of discourse only on the assumption that we have accepted as true what God has revealed. Then we can have discourse which would move from those truths to other truths which are implicit in them, entailed by them, and so forth. One who did not have the faith and who followed that discourse would do so, as I suggested, as a kind of spectator. And he might be able to appraise the discourse in terms of certain canons of rhetoric and logic and so forth, but it would never be for him a vehicle from truth to, to new truth. The point that we wanted to add to that, uh, which uh, is, I think, of, uh, of great importance, is that even though we have this distinction between philosophical arguments on the one hand and theological on the other, characterized as I've just done, we should not think that one's religious beliefs play no role in his philosophizing. That is, it would be bizarre uh, to suppose that one would simply put his faith in escrow when he began to ask questions about the world, about mankind, about what we ought to do, and so forth, as if that were uh, totally irrelevant. Well, you say, wouldn't, wouldn't it have to be Ill irrelevant if a philosophical argument about the matters I've mentioned would not have included in it as a component uh, religious beliefs? Uh, well, it doesn't have uh, religious beliefs included in it as a component if it's a philosophical argument. Nonetheless, if we think of the enterprise of philosophy, of philosophizing, as Joseph Pieper suggested, rather than philosophy, we realize that it's an activity that uh, is carried on uh, in terms of our background beliefs, our commitments, our whole notion of what life is all about. And here, as I suggested, it. It, it's, it's an observable fact that believing philosophers conduct themselves differently from uh, non-believing philosophers. And while we don't have a label for what it is that motivates and, um, and uh, guides the philosophizing of non-believers, labels have been presupposed, what is clear is that there are presuppositions on that side as well. My example in this regard, remember, was that if I, as a Christian, am, am confronted uh, with a philosophical claim that death is the absolute end for a human being, such that I have no destiny beyond this life, uh, I know that's false. Why do I know that's false? Because it is in collision with a Christian truth that I am destined for a life beyond this one, that while created in time, uh, my, uh, uh, my existence will never come uh, to, uh, to an end. So that argument has to be wrong. That's my antecedent uh, belief. That doesn't give me a refutation of that argument, of course, but it gives me a kind of research project. It gives me, uh, it prompts my initial attitude, certainly, towards that, uh, towards that claim. Now, my point was that while that's true of Christians, it's not only true of Christians. Uh, many materialists have an equally uh, uh, spontaneous reaction to proofs which purport to show uh, that the soul is immortal, that there is an existence beyond death, and so forth. They, they, they just sort of begin with the idea that can't be right. Those proofs can't work, so they operate uh, in that particular way. Now, uh, if that is a common uh, situation, as I'm suggesting, moving right along, I would also want to say that there is a tremendous philosophical advantage in being a Christian philosopher. Why? Because if one is guided, as I just indicated, in a kind of antecedent way by one's beliefs in terms of what he thinks is plausible or what he thinks is not plausible, this, he's being guided by what? His belief in certain truths. So that uh, if they're not just hunches, they're not just uh, his training, they're not just what he's used to, but he's accepting certain truths about himself and God and the world uh, which have been revealed. And if these guide his pursuit of natural knowledge of those things, and if truth is uh, such that it couldn't be in conflict, one truth can't be in conflict with another, then you can see he's got a kind of leg up philosophically uh, in terms of, uh, of achieving philosophical philosophical truth. So that uh, when, the, when the church proposes to us uh, the kind of philosophizing that uh, St. Thomas, the kind of philosophy that St. Thomas uh, Aquinas engaged in, this is a philosophical advantage. This is a philosophical advantage. 
clearly the church is uh, is not proposing that we uh, that we study some philosopher who's going to lead us into error or who's uh, or who's uh, whose philosophy is manifestly false or could be shown to be false. We have here a kind of external guarantee. We might say that we're, we're on the right path and we're proceeding uh, in the, in the uh, proper way. Okay, well, all those things, remember we talked about uh, philosophy, its relationship to theology. We wanted to say some things about Christian philosophy. Uh, as you can see, I would like to go on and on about it. I think it's so important a uh, topic. But turning now to moral philosophy as such, there, there are at least two ways in which one could uh, do an introduction to moral philosophy. And first of all, there is a way that I didn't follow, uh, and that would be to take particular problems that people face and to ponder them and to wonder, well, what one ought to do and so forth. And in analyzing those issues, those problems, and of course one would select um, uh, uh, issues that press in upon us today, out of the discussion there would, there would emerge certain principles and criteria for deciding how one ought to proceed or what one ought to do uh, in those circumstances. And that can be a very effective uh, and pedagogically attractive way uh, to introduce one to, the, uh, to uh, moral philosophy. But we have obviously taken uh, a different tack and call it the tack of, of elaborating moral theory or the kind of theoretical framework within which eventually, of course, one is going to want to talk about very specific uh, kind of moral problems and uh, to uh, come up with quite concrete advice uh, as to what one uh, ought to do or what one ought not to do. But uh, there's, there are arguments, uh, as, I, as I say, for both sides. I've chosen this because uh, the works that I, I'm drawing your attention to as I go through, <coughs> the classical works tend to, uh, to approach it from uh, this uh, level of theory or the structure of moral discourse where we start with rather general considerations and then uh, progressively move towards the concrete and towards uh, particular uh, towards particular uh, discussions and, uh, and resolution. So that by way of a kind of general uh, summary of how we've gotten uh, to this point, uh, when we come back in a moment, I, I want to summarize the specific arguments that brought us to uh, the array of virtues that we were talking about uh, at the end of our last lecture, and then we'll be going on to talk about the cardinal virtues. Continuing our review, uh, when we turn specifically uh, to moral philosophy, uh, we ask, well, what is the subject matter of moral philosophy? And what we found Thomas saying is, uh, is this, well, human actions are the subject matter of moral philosophy. Uh, and while that made some kind of initial sense, uh, we, we could imagine difficulties uh, in, uh, in interpreting uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, answer. But uh, let me just give you from the commentary on Aristotle's uh, uh, ethics, uh, Tom, Thomas's commentary, the very first uh, lesson of the first book and the first paragraph of that, where Thomas is uh, giving a little kind of intro to, uh, to uh, philosophy and to moral philosophy, much as I've just been trying to do, where he, uh, he says this, as the philosopher says at the beginning of the metaphysics, the philosopher in the honorific uh, sense is always Aristotle, of course, uh, it is the business of the wise man to order. The reason for this is that wisdom is the most powerful perfection of reason whose characteristic is to know order. Even if the sensitive powers know some things absolutely, that is as such, nevertheless to know the order of one thing to another is exclusively the work of intellect or reason. For example, to see the relationship between something as an effect to something else as its cause. Now a twofold order is found in things, Thomas goes on. One kind is that of parts of a totality, that is a group, uh, among themselves, as the parts of a house are, are mutually ordered, related to each other. And the second order is that of things to an end. This order is of greater importance than the first, for as the philosopher says in the 11th book of the Metaphysics, the order of the parts of an army among themselves exists because of the order of the whole 
army to the commander, so the one order is subordinate to the other. This is uh, this is gives you something of the flavor uh, of Thomas's uh, commentaries on uh, Aristotle, the reference to other writings of Aristotle, seeing the whole effort as a kind of unified one, so that one work uh, uh, casts light on on the other. But I, I'm specifically interested in this now because he goes on to use this notion of order to distinguish four. Uh, orders of things. And he does it this way. Now, order is related to reason in a fourfold way. Uh, there is one order that reason does not establish, but only beholds, such as the order of things in nature, the natural order, as we would say. There is a second order that reason establishes in its own act of consideration. For example, when it arranges its concepts among themselves, and the signs of concepts as well, because words express the meanings of the concept. This is Thomas's understanding of the logical order, which rides kind of piggyback on our knowledge of the real order. So our ordering of our knowledge of the real order uh, produces such things as predicates, subjects, middle terms, arguments, and so forth, which aren't out there and aren't characteristics of the things we're knowing so much as characteristics of our knowing those things. There is a third order, Thomas goes on, that reason in deliberating establishes in the operations of the will. That's, of course, the moral order. And then finally, there is a fourth order that reason in planning establishes in the external things which it causes, such as a chest or a house. So this, this notion of the four orders and of the, of the moral order, that language, the natural order, that language has, uh, has clung to our usage, but we might not uh, have known what the origin uh, of it is, uh, and that particular uh, text uh, gives it uh, to it. But notice now again, to go back to moral philosophy, what Thomas is saying is that the order that reason introduces into our voluntary actions, that's the mor moral order, what we deliberately and freely uh, do. These actions are for the sake of an end. We, uh, we talked uh, then about the way in which from uh, the assumption or the observation that human action is as such uh, end-like, that it is for the sake of an end, that it's teleological, uh, Thomas moves very quickly to the notion that there is an ultimate end, an overarching, uh, embracing end of all that we do. And I, in reflecting uh, on uh, that lecture, I, I wasn't too happy with the way in which I expressed it. So I want, in a moment, uh, to let Thomas talk for himself here. I was citing him, uh, and I think you'll find it uh, clearer. But before doing that, I want to, uh, to say something about the Aristotelian route, because it, uh, it has uh, its attractions. We get, a, we get a, perhaps a more vivid sense of the kind of uh, arrangement of different acts uh, relative to one another uh, that uh, the ultimate end uh, suggests and involves. What, uh, what Aristotle does to illustrate what he means by an ultimate end is uh, this. He says, take uh, a building site. Uh, you look at a building site and there are people doing all kinds of things. Here are bricklayers and here are electricians, here are glaziers, here are plumbers and so forth. And of any group you could ask, well, what are you doing? And you would get an answer. All of those activities, and there would be subordinate activities, of course, to the bricklaying. We'd have hod carriers and people mixing cement and uh, that kind of thing. But that aspect of the, uh, of the building, um, the uh, bricklaying, uh, that would have an end. This wall has to be uh, elevated here. So too with the plumbers, the glaziers, and so forth. But all of these particular activities which have an end which defines what they are, how do you know a bricklayer is a bricklayer because of the function that he is performing on the building site? All of those particular activities with their special end are subordinated to the overall end of putting up that building. And as Aristotle suggests, the architect, meaning the chief builder, is the one who surveys and directs all of these uh, other activities to the end of the building, so that these ends are subordinated to the ultimate overriding end, which is the building. He illustrates this as well, Aristotle does, with the notion of the military. You have the cavalry, you have the artillery, you have the, uh, you have the uh, 
I don't remember all those names suddenly, uh, the infantry of all these various divisions uh, of ordnance of the, of the uh, military. And each of them, if you say, well, what do you do? I'm in ordnance, what's that? And, and uh, the soldier would tell you uh, what, that, uh, what their function is. And so too with the infantry, the artillery, uh, and the like. But all of these are subordinated to the general purpose of the army, which is what? Victory in war. And here we have general officers, as opposed to specific officers, who direct all of these uh, subordinated activities towards this overarching end. So Aristotle puts that uh, out, uh, and then he, he raises the question of the ultimate end against the background of those two examples. And he says, what if there were an ultimate end like that of all human activity as such? That is some overarching, some ultimate, final goal uh, to which all these particular goals are subordinated. If there is such a thing, Aristotle observes, it would be terribly important to know that because it just as it's important for the archer to know where the, uh, where the target is in order to direct the arrow to the target. So too, if, we, if there is such an ultimate end and uh, we, we know it, we will be able to direct our particular activities uh, to that uh, and that will lead to a, a better and a more uh, organized and reasonable uh, life. Uh, at that point, Aristotle suggests, not only is this a possibility, but we're already committed to there being such a thing. And he, uh, he argues this uh, or, or establishes this in two ways. One I mentioned uh, last time. We have a name for it. We have a name for the ultimate end of all of our particular act, and that name is happiness. Whatever we do, whatever specific thing we do, uh, and whatever its specific purpose is, the underlying reason uh, for our doing it is in order to achieve happiness. Furthermore, Aristotle says, if we consider the uh, political order, we find that uh, laws are passed uh, in, in a society governing the external behavior uh, of all kinds of the citizens of that, uh, of that uh, uh, community. So that there are fishing laws and there are driving laws and there are laws for this, there are building laws, there are laws for everything, it would seem. It, what does the legislator, legislature, what do they have in mind when they pass these laws? Well, Aristotle said, clearly, what they have in mind is not just the specific good or aim of those particular endeavors, fishing, hunting, and, uh, and the like, but the common good, the good of society. So in those two ways, Aristotle uh, observes that we are, we are de facto committed uh, to the notion of, a, uh, of an ultimate end. So that then when he turns, as he does then, uh, to the analysis of man's function, looking for what is specific uh, to the human agent and proceeds uh, in the way in which we uh, were observing last time, this is already in the background. So what he is doing uh, 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 in the function argument is articulating a, a point that he feels is already established. So it isn't so much a matter, it would seem, that Aristotle has to prove there is an ultimate end as he's trying to clarify uh, what we mean by an ultimate end. Now, when we talked about Thomas, uh, I, uh, I suggested that what Thomas is saying is that any action, insofar as it is aimed at a good, uh, is seeing a particular thing under the formality of goodness. And uh, while the thing may be good up to a point or share in goodness, it's not goodness itself. So he's suggesting that any particular act has, has involved in it this drive of ours towards goodness as such, and not simply towards this good, that good, and, and the other good. Uh, and in trying to uh, convey his thought uh, last time, as I say, I, I did so in a way that I don't think uh, does justice to him. So let me just read a passage from Thomas uh, that uh, uh, expresses this, uh, this uh, doctrine of his. And you find it in that first part of the second part of the Summa Theologiae uh, that we were looking at last time, question five, article eight, where Thomas is asking, does every man seek happiness? 
this is the end of those five questions, which, as I mentioned, uh, uh, are of such interest in seeing the relationship that Thomas uh, establishes between uh, beatitude as we know about it as Christian believers and beatitude or happiness as the philosophers have spoke about it. So this sort of rounds off his discussion after he's gone into imperfect and perfect happiness and so forth. And uh, uh, again, is it the case that every man desires happiness? And in answering that in the body of the article, uh, he says, well, you know, happiness can be considered in two ways. In one way, according to the common notion of happiness. And in this sense, it's necessary that every human being desire or will happiness. Because the notion of happiness is what? Perfect good, complete good. And uh, so he's saying to seek happiness in this view, is nothing other than to, to will or desire that the will should be satisfied. That's what seeking happiness is. That's what the ultimate end is. And Thomas then adds, quod quilibut vult, huh? which everyone wants, huh? the, that his will uh, should be satisfied, that his desire uh, should, be, should be satisfied. Okay, next time we'll be uh, getting into the uh, array of virtues that we stopped with last time and going on to the concept of cardinal virtues. Well, so we come uh, now again to the uh, concept of virtue and we will be going on in a moment to the discussion of moral virtue. Uh, the approach to virtue, recall, is this, that we look for that which is the characteristic function or work of man. And if man has such a function, then we are able to say that to perform that function well gives us a basis for describing someone as a good human being, as a good man. And the basis for that uh, kind of uh, argument uh, is uh, that uh, we, that's the way we would proceed if we ask whether something were a good watch or a good golfer or a good uh, uh, driver or what have you. Uh, we would ask, well, what is it that he's supposed to be doing? And in looking at that particular function, we would uh, dis uh, discover the criteria for determining whether or not the function was being done well or badly. The well performance of the function is the basis for saying this is a good such and such or so and so. Okay. So the, uh, the uh, notion of virtue, notice, is, is brought in in that way. Uh, virtue can very often uh, seem to have a kind of uh, ethereal uh, tone to it. Uh, someone who's virtuous, who uh, does something over and above, etc. What it means here is simply doing well what you're doing. The arete, the perfection, the fulfillment of uh, that particular uh, that particular function, and, and that's carried over. So the arete of a horse is that it runs well, or that it pulls a load well. So it it, it has that kind of modest uh, origin uh, linguistically, so that we can carry it over. It, it's straightforward. It, uh, we know what we're saying, what we're not saying. It's not something that uh, let's say you have to be a moral intuitionist uh, to uh, to get a hold of. In fact, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this was brought back into contemporary discussions of, uh, of uh, the analysis of action uh, as a counter move to intuitionist uh, uh, analysis. So a virtue is the well performance of a function. If man has a function, uh, then performing that function well is the basis for saying that someone is a good man. Aristotle says there is such a function. What is it? It's rational activity. Now that led very quickly to the realization that rational acti activity does not name some one simple single thing. Uh, it seems to cover lots of different uh, operations and activities. And indeed it does, but as I, as I stressed, we shouldn't think of this as some kind of criticism of the view that we, that we are setting forth. The view that we are setting forth is the first to point out that of course, uh, rational activity as the human function, as that which distinguishes human beings from all other agents, is not just some one single activity. It's an array of activities which are, which are related in a quite determinate way. And what we saw was that uh, the first distinction, which uh, Aristotle makes implicitly, Thomas makes it explicit uh, in his commentary and then uses it in the moral part of the Summa and elsewhere whenever he talks about uh, morality, just again and again and again, uh, the basic distinction is between 
rational activity essentially considered, that is the activity of the mind as such, of reason as such, and rational activity in a participated sense, the way in which the activities of our limbs and so forth can be said to be rational insofar as they are directed by reason. We have a similar sort of uh, situation in terms of uh, using the term voluntary. Voluntary can mean either the activity of the will as such, uh, and then we speak of elicited acts of the will, or it can mean acts of, of uh, say, our, our limbs and so forth, inso insofar as they are commanded and deliberately performed, voluntarily performed. So that voluntary uh, has, these, uh, has these two senses. Now, voluntary uh, and, and involuntary is, is a very important topic to which we want to, uh, to come back before we go on to talk about cardinal virtues. But first of all, let, let's make sure that we see that we are at the point where we can begin talking about the cardinal virtues. If you have uh, a distinction between uh, essential uh, rational activity in the essential sense, and rational activity in the participated sense, then right away we can say to do the one or the other well gives us at least two virtues. Huh? Two, two, two virtues, two excellences, two well performances of, of uh, that activity or those activities as we can now uh, call them, but those activities which count as instances of rational activity. Well, Aristotle uh, and Thomas also distinguish within essential rational activity between the theoretical use of our reason and the practical use of our reason. And we'll see other uh, distinctions over here in terms of the participated uh, sense of rational activity. So you see what begins to emerge is this, that the human good uh, is an array of virtues. It's an array of virtues, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an ordering that has to go on in, a, in, a, in many departments of our life. But there's an overall ordering insofar as we are, we are seeing these things as, as, uh, as uh, aimed at our overall good. Because remember, what's, what's overarching all of these is the notion of our complete good. And what this subdivision uh, into the various virtues uh, is, is saying is our complete good is realized in all of these ways, in these various components. So these have to be arranged and ordered in a certain way in order uh, for them to, uh, to uh, receive in a, in a fitting way uh, the designation of the ultimate end. Uh, you can see what I'm saying. If, if as St. Paul says, there are those whose God is their belly, huh? who use Deus Vinter S, he's saying that there are certain people who are gluttons uh, for whom the uh, eating alone is the overall purpose of human life. So it's as if you've got uh, the notion of an overall purpose of human life, and then you have gluttons who say, it's food. Huh? Okay, what we're, have, what, we're, what we're getting here is that there is this sense of an overall purpose of human life, and what fills it in is not some one activity or operation, but a whole array of operations well performed. So we can say a whole array of virtues, and these arranged and ordered uh, in a uh, particular way. That human actions uh, must be uh, deliberate and voluntary uh, is something that we stressed uh, from uh, the very beginning. Uh, the, the concept of a distinction between the voluntary and the involuntary uh, is a way of excluding uh, certain acts that seem to be human acts but turn out not to be human acts. And when we introduced that with Thomas, we saw him saying, well, there are human actions and then there are acts of a man. And if we ask, ask what an act of a man is, uh, we, would give exa we gave examples like digesting or falling off a building and, and so forth. These are things uh, that are truly ascribed to a human being, but we don't ask, why is he doing that? in the sense that uh, he sets his mind to it and so forth. But when we raise the question uh, of the voluntary and the involuntary, we're able to make that distinction in a way that is more interesting for the moral order and shows that sometimes, although we, we, we know what we're looking for when we want to make that distinction, it's not always very clear as to where exactly we can make it. Uh, the discussion of the voluntary and the involuntary, the classical uh, place for it, is in the third book 
uh, of the, the Nicomachean Ethics of, uh, of Aristotle, uh, and in Thomas's commentary, uh, Lesson 4, the definition of the voluntary. Uh, he also discusses it uh, in Question 6 uh, of the Prima Secundae. Uh, this, 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 is, uh, this is the way he approaches the notion of the involuntary. If the voluntary is that which proceeds from will and reason, deliberate, uh, we deliberate, we know what we're doing, and we freely do it. Remember, we gave those components of the human act. Insofar as there is some kind of defect, either on the side of knowledge or on the side of, uh, of the will, we're going to uh, question whether or not the act uh, performed is voluntary. Now, just to indicate to you how uh, dramatic uh, this difficulty can be, uh, you remember in, in uh, Greek tragedy uh, that uh, uh, Oedipus uh, uh, comes to town, uh, and uh, as he's entering town, he bumps into a stranger, and they get into an argument, and he kills the stranger. Uh, he comes into the town, and uh, after a time, he, real, he's, he learns is a very eligible widow, and she's the queen. Uh, and he gets to know her, and one thing leads to another, and they get married. Now, what emerges, uh, and of course the audience knows this all along, uh, is that uh, Oedipus is the daughter, or is, uh, the son of Jocasta, the queen, uh, uh, the woman that uh, he has married, and the man he killed uh, on the road coming into town was his father. Uh, and we know that when they had this child, all kinds of dire predictions were made that he would be the downfall of the city. So they farmed him out. They, they sent him off to another town, had him raised uh, by someone else, and uh, he didn't know who he, who he was, and they didn't know really where uh, he was. So here you have a situation you know, where uh, a man marries his mother, incest. A, 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 a woman marries her son, incest. But did they? I mean, neither one of them knew what they were doing. So here, here is a case where we would say it looks to be uh, an action that they're deliberately and voluntarily entering into, but the act that they think they're performing is not the act that they're really performing. So can they be held accountable for the act that uh, I just call what they're really performing, or do we hold them accountable only for the act that they knowingly or think they, they are performing? And you can see that the answer would be uh, fairly, uh, fairly evident. Uh, so that ignorance, uh, the lack of deliberation or knowledge in an action, or ignorance of the circumstances, certain facts about the case, will prevent the act from being a voluntary act of incest. They don't choose or deliberately uh, do that. So here, a, a diminution of one aspect of the human act, knowledge, causes us to say this is not voluntary, the marrying of uh, the parent or of the child uh, in, this, uh, in this particular case. Of course, ignorance, as we'll, we'll be seeing when we talk about conscience later, sometimes we're responsible for our ignorance, but that could hardly be uh, applicable uh, in the case uh, in question. Uh, another way in which we can, uh, we can ask or, or uh, wonder whether an act is voluntary uh, is one uh, where there is suasion or pressure. Now, of course, if somebody was simply picked up and carried off someplace, uh, we don't ask why they're going across the room. They are not going across the room in the sense of a, of a deliberate voluntary act. They are being propelled across the room or carried across the room. So here, violence is being done to them, and they are not contributing to the act. So we wouldn't we wouldn't say that's a voluntary, someone is leaving the room voluntarily if they're being hustled out of the, out of the room. Uh, so uh, in that case, clearly, uh, it's uh, where there's force or violence, it's easy to, uh, to exempt that from the realm of moral actions is the sort of thing that we have to appraise and, and attribute to people. But there are, there are subtler forms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, pressure and suasion and so forth, psychological pressure. And here it, it becomes uh, very difficult sometimes to discern whether or not, in our own case or certainly in the case of others, whether they are acting freely whether they are acting freely. So that uh, the, the, the matter that we, we introduced in a fairly uh, simple way as acts of a man and human acts uh, is one which on reflection become, can become a good deal more uh, complicated. Now, uh, when we do return, we will do what we set out to do uh, in this lecture, and that is to say some things about the cardinal virtues. Okay, uh, we'll turn uh, now to uh, the uh, cardinal virtues and arriving at them uh, in continuation with what we were just saying. We end up, uh, after our analysis of uh, 
the uh, perfection or excellence of rational activity, we end up by realizing that uh, since rational activity means a variety of things, there will be a variety of virtues uh, that a human being should be striving for in order to uh, qualify as a good uh, human uh, being. Uh, the um, sub-distinctions of uh, rational activity can go on quite a bit, so we can get a, a tremendous number uh, of virtues if you if you look at the uh, second part of the second part uh, of the um, of the Summa Theologiae of Thomas, you find him just t discussing virtue after virtue after virtue and subsets of virtue and so forth. And uh, sometimes uh, we can lose the sense of what it is that gathers them all together. Well, there is and there has been since time immemorial a notion that there are certain key virtues, certain cardinal virtues around which uh, uh, other virtues swing. Uh, the, the, uh, the term uh, from which the word is taken uh, is precisely hinge, so that we're looking for uh, kind of key virtues, hinge virtues, which will enable us to gather all sorts of other subsidiary virtues uh, under, under them. Uh, the uh, way in which uh, these uh, cardinal virtues uh, are uh, established uh, is uh, various, but uh, here's the way uh, Thomas does it uh, in the uh, first part of the second part of the, uh, of the uh, Summa Theologiae, uh, question uh, 61, de virtutibus cardinalibus, uh, precisely asking uh, uh, about cardinal virtues. He will go on and ask about the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. And if you read this part of the Summa, you're prepared for the structure uh, of the next, uh, or the continuation of the moral uh, part of the, of the uh, uh, Summa. Uh, in Article 1, he discusses uh, uh, what he means by or what is meant by cardinal virtues, the principal virtues, the chief virtues. Uh, uh, chief in the sense that uh, they are def they're, uh, uh, they're quite distinct from one another, but they're also general in the sense that lots of other subsidiary virtues uh, fall under them. In the second article, uh, he asked, well, whether there are four, uh, and uh, that is the traditional number, as I say, we find it already in Plato, uh, but uh, Thomas, uh, being the kind of uh, thinker he is, wants to give us a, a basis or a reason for arriving at that particular number. Uh, and as a matter of fact, he gives us two reasons in, in this article, uh, asking whether or not, whether there are four cardinal virtues. Um, and he says, um, uh, it, sh uh, it should be said that the number of, uh, of things can be drawn either uh, or based either upon their formal principles or on their subjects, the things in which the formal principles are, are uh, realized. And in both ways, it's found that there are four cardinal virtues. And let's look at the first way. The formal principle of virtue, that which in virtue of which we define a virtue, uh, is the good of reason, the good of reason. We know what we're doing in virtuous activity. Reason is directing uh, its own operation or the operations of other faculty. So the formal note in virtue is the ratio boni, or the, uh, me, the bonum rationis, the good of reason. And this can be considered, Thomas goes on to say, in two ways. Uh, in one way, insofar as, as the good of reason consists in the very consideration of reason itself, reason essentially considered, as we were uh, speaking uh, earlier, and here he says there is one principal virtue, and he gives the traditional name prudentia, prudence, sophrosinai. Uh, prudence uh, has taken on uh, uh, connotations for us that uh, cause it to get in the way, cause the term to get in the way of what Thomas is saying here. We think uh, often of uh, the prudent man, not simply as one who's heavily insured, but someone who is calculating in what he does. So, so he acts prudently in the sense that he's looking out for his own interest uh, in uh, deciding uh, what he's uh, going to do. That isn't what uh, uh, the uh, meaning of the term here is. It's practical wisdom would be perhaps a better rendering of it given what's uh, happened to prudence in our language. But if we think of the, of the virtue as bearing on, on the, on the uh, good of reason as such, uh, then we're going to say, well, prudence is the perfection of reasoning, practical reasoning. In another way, insofar uh, as the order of reason is imprinted on something else. And either this is on operations, uh, 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 Thomas uh, puts it, and then the virtue involved is justice, 
or the imprint of reason is on our passions or emotions, and then either it's going to be on those emotions which draw us towards things which might cause us not to follow uh, the guidance of reason, and what we need is a governing uh, of those impulses, of course, by reason, and that virtue is temperance or moderation. Uh, there are also uh, uh, impulses that we have where we're uh, in fear of peril, of uh, menacing objects, and our, our inclination, our instinct is to flee them, to get out of the way. Uh, sometimes to do that would be to threaten the overall good of the human being. So that uh, this uh, impulse or these emotions have to be, have to be ruled. The principal uh, thing in view, uh, Aristotle says, with respect to this virtue, fortitude, courage is the name of it, of course, is death, is death. So that uh, the, uh, our facing up uh, to our mortality uh, is one of the great demands of human existence. How we, how we comport ourselves uh, in uh, the light of the, of the uh, ineluctable fact that we are going to die uh, is, uh, is a mark of the virtuous man, and it is the rock bottom uh, aspect of the virtue of fortitude. As the word perhaps suggests to you, uh, it has its first and most obvious uh, manifestations uh, in the military, in defending uh, one's family or one's city against the enemy and so forth, and the way in which one uh, would uh, run the risk of harm and of death in order to preserve that good. This is this courage in, in, in the sense that we honor and rightly honor. Uh, but courage is also, uh, and uh, Aristotle suggests, Fundamentally, everyone is going to confront death, if not necessarily on a battlefield. And the way in which we rationally, reasonably adjust ourselves uh, to that realization uh, is uh, courage uh, for most of us. There are all kinds of ordinary and daily uh, indications of, of courage as well, where we, uh, we uh, do not shrink from the possibility of harm, where to do so would be to threaten uh, our overall good, often in, in uh, relatively undramatic uh, uh, circumstances. So uh, you, you can see there uh, the way in which his uh, portrait of the way in which the, of the, uh, the, the four principal or cardinal virtues emerge is, is very much in continuity uh, with what we were talking about on an Aristotelian basis of the di uh, distinction between essential rational activity on the one hand and participated rational activity on the other. What you'll find missing uh, from this are the virtues of the theoretical intellect. Huh? But as I was indicating uh, last time, again in a way that I wasn't in retrospect too satisfied with, uh, the thing about uh, the virtues of uh, the theoretical use of our intellect is that they are partial perfections uh, of us. They don't perfect us in our totality, whereas those virtues that have their seat in appetite, justice, temperance, and fortitude engage us more totally, more completely as a person than simply the use of our mind does, leading to what we uh, were pointing to last time uh, as the, the awful instance where somebody, uh, because of the knowledge that he has, can uh, cause a great deal of harm uh, to other people, and the fact that he does that doesn't take away from the fact that he really has that knowledge. Uh, so that uh, the virtue of the theoretical use of the intellect can be there, and it doesn't ensure its good use. Uh, so Thomas uh, will often put it that way, that the, that the intellectual virtues, the uh, virtues of the theoretical use of mind, uh, more specifically, give us a capacity to act well, but not the inclination to act well. And uh, that led us to suggest that what we need for the, for the appropriate use of uh, the virtues of theoretical intellect are the moral virtues. Okay, so that, that then takes us back to uh, the arrangement of these various virtues now which come under and satisfy uh, the general notion of an ultimate end or that which will be completely fulfilling of it. We now see that unlike the glutton who wants to take one thing, eating, and say that's what it's all about and everything else is subordinated to that, uh, what uh, the true view turns out to be is that since rational activity has a variety of meaning, we are, uh, we are uh, going to have to acquire a variety of virtues. How do they relate to one another? Now, the, what I've just said again would lead us to, to uh, put the primacy, uh, the, uh, the principal emphasis, uh, on the moral virtues. 
uh, and on that intellectual virtue of prudence, which of course is complementary uh, of them and without which they would not uh, come into being because prudence is the guide, the rational guide for appetition. Uh, so it the, puts the imprint of reason on these uh, desires and, uh, uh, and emotion. Uh, here uh, you have uh, uh, a very close connection between the virtue of, uh, of the intellectual virtue of prudence on the one hand and moral virtues on the other. So we tend to, we tend to put the emphasis there. Nonetheless, as, 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 uh, as you uh, remember, uh, Aristotle sees as the ultimate aim of human life, not the acquisition and exercise of the moral virtues, but contemplation of the divine. And in the very structure of the Nicomachean Ethics, as you can see if you look particularly at Thomas's commentary, everything marches towards that. So that uh, the, intellect, the moral virtues are desirable and are acquired ultimately in order that the human person can be freed to turn his attention to the common good of the universe as such, namely to God. So that uh, contemplation, this uh, uh, intellection par excellence, uh, turns out to be the ultimate end, that is, the most important uh, of the uh, perfections of rational activity within the set of, uh, of, uh, of virtue. This leading, uh, as I indicated, uh, to uh, the seeming paradox. Uh, we have a series of them here that rational activity in a secondary sense is where virtue is primarily found. And then if we begin to array the virtues and ask for their hierarchy, while well, from the point of view of, uh, of uh, a chronological point of view, we perhaps would want to say the moral virtues uh, are most important and would take primacy, we end up uh, with the suggestion that they are really uh, instrument. They're, they're goods in themselves, but they are ordered to a further end, that is, to the perfection of mind as such. And while from a philosophical point of view, uh, this has led uh, to the charge of elitism against uh, Aristotle, after all, how many uh, within the community are going to devote themselves uh, to uh, contemplation, we as Christians uh, are able to see that this is the common calling, vocation, end of every human soul, uh, union with God and the beatific vision.